will turn out 89%. 2010 turn out 59%. The uh, Labour member elected in 1950, Frank Coleridge, that started off working right at the age of 13, going down the Yorkshire Bites. The 2010 MP, the graduates, and then on to the trade union official. A year after the 1950 election, Frank Coleridge was dying of pneumoconiosis. After the 2010 election, they were going to be using jail for the expenses. As I say, not totally typical, but sort of in rather extreme form, showing that things have changed over those uh, 60 years. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I wrote a blog about what I call pygmy politics. And, and you know, I, I, I believe in may just be me getting on in the network, please, so I'm not standing, of course, there. But I do think there is a fundamental contrast between the big arguments of class of ideology from the middle of the 20th century, fought by big politicians, most of whom being in the Second World War, and a number of our first of all, politicians, such as one Remember, it's like the white law for the, the, the bravery in combat, and for whom politics was both a noble thing to do to build up Britain after the war, but also people who had the perspective of having been shot at and knowing, as it were, that democratic politics actually isn't quite like killing or being killed. And today, um, the ideological battle has been solved, um, class differences, employment patterns are utterly different, and the, the, the youthful frame of reference of these the politicians is much more likely to have been that of a 22-year-old span of the Ministry of Culture, um, but certainly in North Africa or outside Monte Cassino or in Normandy. <coughs> and it does seem to me that both the, the people and the arguments are just smaller than they were when I was a, a young lad growing up. Um, however, this is a sort of a big, unsophisticated um, overview. And what we're going to do in the next few hours is drill down into um, these issues. Um, and uh, is the civic culture of politics something that could only exist in the form of the community of in those days of, of, of big arguments, big politics, big politicians. Is it something, by its very nature, we can't get back? Or is it something in today's very really different political and economic and social um, <coughs> context, social inclusion, of course? Um, you know, not only television, these things, but Facebook and so on, other than the big union meetings of, of, of decades ago. Is there a way it can be revived, or is it worth the effort to? So, those are some big questions to start with. But I'm going to ask um, um, Ben Sides to give a more specific introduction to today's programme before we get on to more likely the first of the three major presentations. Uh, hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ben Sides, I teach at the University of um, Kent. Uh, thank you very much for coming along today. Um, I hope you find the day useful and formative. Um, I'm not going to say uh, a great deal, I'm just going to uh, say very briefly why this conference is taking place, what it might achieve, some of the things that Peter's already uh, talked about, and then of course a couple of dull and just arrangements um, <coughs> at the end. The, the, the rationale for the conference was um, very simple. It is that we, uh, of course, hear a lot of the fact that citizens are distrustful of governments, they don't like politics, they have very little confidence in political institutions. But actually, in Britain at least, I think there's been rather little research on this issue. So it's an, an ongoing policy problem for many people, it's widely cited from the media, but actually the research base on what citizens think about politics in Britain and why they might distrust politicians and politics is, to my mind, at least rather 
And yet in the last couple of years, we've had a number of research projects, most of which are being presented today, which have addressed exactly that issue. So, so the rationale for the conference was very simple. It is bring together some of the most recent research on citizen discontent to see what individually they suggest about the reasons for citizen disengagement and also collectively. So I don't suppose by any means, by the end of the conference, we will have cracked uh, this particular nut. We will know exactly how to revive the civic culture in Britain, even if that's something we want to do. But at least hopefully we will have a slightly clearer perspective on what the nature of citizen discontent is and what we might do um, uh, about it. So the, the projects here are very different. Most of them involve figures. I shall warn you now. Um, <laughs> But some are more qualitative in nature, but what they all share is a focus on some aspect of citizen discontent. What is the phenomenon? Why are people discontented with politics? And I guess that from that view, what, what we might do about it. So th this is the lineup for um, <coughs> so um, why the University of Essex is going to talk about why. How, how trust in government has changed in the last 10 to 15 years, and what kind of features have shifted those changes. Um, then Sarah Birch at the University of Glasgow is going to talk about people's attitude towards political conduct or misconduct amongst political elites, uh, and what kind of factors shape people's judgments about uh, misbehaviour. I guess it's maybe a kind of neutral way of describing it amongst kind of political elites. Then a project that I've worked on with John Curtis, slight change of tack, is going to focus on, well, firstly, what is the nature of political trust in Britain today, but also how far does changing the political system stand the chance, maybe, of re-engaging those citizens who are particularly distrustful of politics and of politicians. And then three sessions that I've grouped together because they all speak more broadly to the, the theme of what is it that citizens actually want from politics? Or what is it that citizens dislike with politics as, as it is um, currently practiced? So Jerry Stokes from the University of Southampton is a very interesting uh, primary qualitative work looking at what citizens um, uh, want from politics and what are the kind of reforms they would like to see in, in broad terms of the political system. Paul Webb, who's going to look at different groups within, distinctions between different groups in society and how different groups take a very different attitude towards the kind of political system they would like to see and what kind of engagement they would like to have with the political system. And then finally, Chris Carlin from the University of Glasgow is going to look at one particular aspect of politics, which is particularly resonant in these days of coalition government. What are citizens' attitudes towards what you might call principled politics versus compromised politics. Do citizens prefer politics that is, uh, politicians standing up and saying, here I stand up and go no further, or do they prefer politicians to engage in, in bargaining and compromise? Okay, so rather different perspectives around the common theme on um, political, political discontent and political alienation. Um, okay, so that's, that's how the program maps out, and I thought we'd run the presentations together uh, and then maybe have time for kind of audience discussion and questions afterwards rather than having this, because the presentation is kind of overlapped. So I guess if, 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 if someone has given a presentation and you have a burning question, you know, what does this mean, a point of clarification, that would be fine. But I feel like maybe discussion at the end of the three morning presentations, at the end of the three afternoon presentations would be, would probably be the best. Okay. Um, right, now a few dull logistic um, arrangements. Um, first of all, I ought to record my uh, few thanks, um, primarily to the um, uh, two funders, namely the Political Studies Association, who put up most of the money for this conference. Um, and I'll film so, so, some of it, some of the presentations will, will be online and also to my own institution who came to provide some match funds. Thank you for that. Thank you to the speaker. This is probably the worst probably the worst um, week of the whole year, given that it's the start of term. So to actually persuade uh, all my academic colleagues to come and give presentations this week, thank you very much for um, doing that. <coughs> I didn't have students to teach this week, but um, I'm sure I had plenty of other um, business at UBS. So thank you very much, Peter, for agreeing to come along and 
chair today. Um, lunch will be just a few kind of these. The toilets are out there to the right, but it, in, in the event of a fire alarm, it's just through the main exit. Um, lunch will be just out there. You would, you would walk past the kind of tables, lunch is between one and two. Apologies, there are, there are, I think, three other conferences here today. So you'll have to share space with notably 400 social psychologists who are next door discussing happiness. Some of you might have had a rough <laughs> When you came in, you were asked conference for happiness or conference for discontent. <laughs> you, 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 you pick the short straw. If, if lunch is slightly kind of boisterous and rowdy, I kind of do apologise. <laughs> That's, that's, that's social psychologist uh, for you. And I, I, I think the, the PSA are filming the presentations, but I, I, not the discussions. I presume the discussion will be under kind of Chatham House rules and people can say whatever they um, wish. Is that okay? Is there any, any questions there? Will they be putting the presentations on a website? On a website, that's, that's one thing I should have said. Virtually all the presentations are on the website for this conference, which most of you, I've sent around the link. If you type in Civic Culture Conference, <coughs> it comes up if you can't remember it. Not all of the presentations are up there, but most of them are. So if you want to kind of print off any of them at a later stage, you can do so. I mean, of course, if you have any problems, do let me know, and I can, I can provide those presentations for you. But they are, almost all of them are up there on the website. Um, you will probably be relieved rather appalled to discover that I don't have a chairman's brief which would have allowed me to read out the biographical. But I'm sure you all know all of them anyway, and therefore it would simply be a waste of time. If you don't know who they are and you're desperately wanting a brief introduction, tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but certainly, Paul Whiteley, my old friend from Essex University, I'm sure you all know extremely well. Um, 
Between 1997 and 2003, the data comes from telephone surveys that Gallup did for us. And these were rather short because there are limitations of telephones surveys, and, but it was about a thousand cases a month, some missing data, but we can sort that out, not too much. From 2004 onwards, um, the surveys have been done on the internet with YouGov as the provider. And these are bigger, and it's possible to ask more questions and model things more fully. So I'll talk a little bit about the whole thing. Um, to begin with, and then come back to the 2004 to the present period where it's possible to do uh, a lot more fancy modeling. Total sample size, I think, mean, 200,000, which is kind of, you know, when it mounts up at that level, um, you can really sort of impact the dynamics. So the modeling, two stages. One is time series modeling of the aggregate variables, in other words, month by month. The percentage each month we think that government is honest uh, as opposed to the ones who don't. Um, and we can do a little bit of that uh, with a restricted model to get an overview of what the dynamics are. And there's some advantages of that. But then the second bit, which is the 2004 onwards, is a multi-level model where you're actually modeling what individuals think. But you're bringing in events and aggregate level effects, which I'll talk a bit more about, um, to complement this. Okay, there's the raw data. That's from 1997, just after the election, June to uh, 2013. It takes us up to July, actually, this year. About a third of people think government is honest, on average, over this period. And as you can see, 57% don't think it's honest, and there's some don't know. So it isn't a strong endorsement of government honesty. There's widespread perceptions that government is not very honest. This, of course, conceals a lot of interesting variation over time. And this, in some ways, is the core um, bit of the presentation. This is the percentage each month who say, yes, the government is honest, I think it is honest and trustworthy. Um, and you can see there's quite an enormous variations, and they're affected by events that have occurred <coughs> over this period. For instance, in the case of the Afghan war, there was a bit of a rally before it started, but then honesty, perceptions of honesty went down after it started, and that was even more apparent in the case of the Iraq war. There's a bit of a rally to begin with, and then people get fed up pretty quickly. The MP's expenses scandal represents the lowest um, point of this series. It was just about 85% after the general election victory in 97, and it reached 16% after the MP's expenses crisis. Notice the, the framing of the uh, question is about government being honest. So government got it in the neck for the expenses crisis, even though arguably, you know, lots of other people are involved as well. Lots of dynamics there. It rallies a little bit uh, as a result of elections, and certainly rallies quite a lot as a result of a change of government, although bear in mind we've only got two changes of government here. Um, if you, uh, there is some scattered data before 97, and it shows, you know, that um, in the run up, in the run-up to the Labour's victory, uh, trust was pretty low because of the major government, and it reached very rapidly a high, which then uh, it declined from after that. Okay, the aggregate analysis. Government is, honesty is driven by the state of the economy. It's driven by other things, but we'll use that as the measure of, out of outcomes. Okay, because that data is... Uh, pretty well available. And if the economy is doing well, performance should make people trust an incumbent for delivering on prices. Question in the surveys repeatedly asked about whether uh, people think the government treats them fairly or not. And this is the fairness measure. People feel about a fair hearing, even if it didn't work out, then they more likely think government is trustworthy. And then there's some control measures which we put in 
uh, particularly partisanship, people's party identification, and what they think of leaders. Clearly, if you're a Labour partisan, you're a bit more likely to trust the government during the Labour incumbency than if you're not. So you have to take into account things like that. The way people perceive uh, what the government is doing if you want to get a proper picture. This is the model. Don't worry too much about it. It looks more complicated than it is. What essentially it's doing is showing that changes in trust, G is government honesty, uh, so you're looking at current government honesty, lack government honesty, so you're measuring changes, and these are the short run effects, and these are the long run effects. So essentially that's what the model is showing, and it enables us to see if these measures don't just, you know, ju aren't just related, but what the economists call co-integrate, dance together, reinforce each other over time. And it turns out a couple of them do. Well, um, this is the estimation, and for those who want to look at this, it's in the paper. But all I'll say now is that the basic <coughs> model, OLS model, the standard model, is unreliable because there's some problems with it, econometric problems, which are ident identified down there. And basically, we have to mess around with it. And in particular, the key thing we have to do is model not just changes in trust, but changes in the variability of trust, the variance of trust. And that's what this arch model, as it's called, does. You take into account how much it fluctuates. Because if you look back at the earlier chart, you can see that sometimes it fluctuates quite a lot. Sometimes it just doesn't. That's a measure of people changing their minds at the aggregate level. If you see a lot of fluctuation, people are thinking, well, what's going on here? I'm going to change my mind about this. And so you have to take that into account, otherwise you get a poor picture. Now, what matters here is a couple of things, just let me point out. Labour leader evaluations there is highly significant in the short term, and it's also highly significant in long term, which means that sort of dances around, it co-integrates with government honesty. It's really bound up with it. Um, and you can see um, what I mean by that by just looking at the chart. I mean, they dance together very carefully. Government honesty is the blue line. Labour leader evaluations is the red line. And you can see there, you know, it goes up there and the, the other one goes up. It goes up there and similarly down here. Except, you see, you're right here and it suddenly goes into reverse. Which is exactly what we would expect because that's the general election. And Labour's been kicked out. So now, if you're uh, admiring the Labour leader, you're now looking at it very differently from before. So it, why, you know, it goes up here after the election, while the Labour leadership thing goes down um, as the transition from Gordon Brown to Ed Milburn took place. So that's what it means. It, it closely correlates with each other. There's another uh, thing that does too, and this is a measure of satisfaction with democracy, a broad measure of are you satisfied with the way democracy is working or not. Now here, this starts in 2000 because we didn't ask the questions earlier. But you can see how it has this similar kind of pattern. Not quite so close as the leadership one, but people feeling satisfied with democracy are more likely to trust the government, and people who are more likely to trust the government are more likely to feel satisfied with democracy. It's like that. Broad conclusions from the aggregate analysis there. Well, um, policy satisfaction is driven by the economy, so the effects there are related to the economy. Um, and satisfaction with the way the system works, government fairness, democratic satisfaction also plays. But leadership evaluations are really important. Party leaders are a heuristic. They're a mechanism which people use to make fast and frugal judgments about governments. So if your party leader is dishonest, perceived to be, <coughs> the whole government is in trouble. That's what this uh, shows. Okay. Um, now, going on to the multi-level analysis, this, for reasons I mentioned earlier, can be more general. It can take into account more things because the surveys are much bigger and we've asked lots of other questions in. So you're looking at the period 2000 
2004 to 2010, right. separating these out, i.e. the Labour government's period, and then 2010 to 2013, the coalition government period. Um, it's a good idea to do that because when there's a shift of government, as these earlier charts shows, you know, the results bounce around and get, and they have to get back to equilibrium before we can make any sense of them. A, cha a big shift in the regime, as it's called, uh, can shift effects. So, for this purpose, we're just looking at how Labour did and how the uh, coalition is subsequently doing. Adding a few variables, um, there's measures of what we call effective economic evaluations. That's um, how people. What, what, what are people's gut feelings about the economy? Not, not the, you know, am I doing okay, or is the country doing well, but how do I feel about it? Effective reasoning, as it's called, is quite an important topic now in um, political psychology, and it sits alongside cognitive reasoning, where, you know, cognitive reasoning is about the costs and benefits, and is there advantages or disadvantages, and so on. So we're looking at effective reasoning as well, we're adding, um, oh, hang on. We're adding policy, additional policy evaluation variables, crime, the NHS, education. So it's not just about the economy, it's about these other things too. Public service delivery. And the argument is the same. If public service delivery is good, you trust. If, if it's not, you don't. Um, there's a couple of additional items which capture this fairness, but really, from the perspective of competence, for instance, we've got lots of questions about, uh, 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 serious questions about, do you think, who, which is the best party in managing the economy? And you can say Conservatives, Labour, Labour, or you can say none of them. Turns out there's big changes in the latter, especially recently. And that's an index of when you think the system is competent. Can it deliver anything? So it's really about process as much as anything else. And we add that to test that. Similarly, uh, there's a question about, does any leader make the best prime minister? And again, you can answer, none of them do. And that's taken a big increase, too, in recent years. So that's another aspect of when you think the system is delivering it all. Finally, just to throw in a, 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 an argument that's been around for a while, it's the so-called media malaise hypothesis. If you read newspapers particularly, um, we looked also at the internet a little bit, because newspapers, for good reasons, emphasize the negative, are you going to be inherently made cynical by that? Is there uh, a malaise arising from um, being uh, exposed heavily to, to the media? All right. Now, uh, I, those are all at the individual level. We're modeling individuals at that level. But there's some other things needed to be incorporated to make, uh, that could influence individuals. And a couple of them here, a dummy variable to, uh, that determines, that enables us to find out whether Tony Blair was trusted more than Gordon Brown or less than Gordon Brown during the period of the late government. Because it spans, 2004 to 2010, of course, spans the two apprenticeships. Um, the MP MPs expenses scandal we've already referred to and it looks like the government took a hit on that so that's included as an aggregate level measure. Um, in the coalition model there was a, co a coalition honeymoon that took place immediately after the election. This phenomenon that elections make people think you know governments are more honest. So we're modeling that but also, in particular, the Omni Shambles budget from uh, 2012, last year, if you remember, which was very badly received, and the government did lots of U-turns and so on. Did that affect things independently of other factors? Okay, well, there's lots of coefficients there, and I'm not going to try and go through them all. But the basic story is that the economic evaluations all played in the Labour government model so did effective evaluation, so did crime, health, education. All of these contributed to perceptions of government honesty. And the bottom line is if you felt these were doing well, you would think the government was honest. If you felt they were doing badly, you would think the opposite. The um, fairness measure is still important. So if you think the government treated you fairly, 
that will help. The no leader is best prime minister has had a negative effect. If you think <coughs> about the lot of them, it's going to make you independently think government is dishonest. No party is best on the economy. Nobody can handle it. That became a particularly important thing after the uh, you know, crash in 2008. That affected Labour and made people think that they were more dishonest. There's the democratic sat satisfaction. Just draw attention to one thing. These are partisanship measures, and the argument is, you know, partisanship colors your judgment. Well, you can see that the partisanship measures were positive in the case of Labour. Labour partisanship was positive during the Labour government. Shift over to the coalition model, and it switches sides and becomes negative, which is exactly what you'd expect. If you're a Labour partisan, you more likely think the um, coalition is dishonest. Which is, so it's really for, to control for that more than anything else. Finally, um, so these are all pretty much controls. Newspaper readership has a negative effect, so there is a bit of evidence for the media relays argument. People are heavily exposed tend to be a bit more cynical about government than people who are not. Although, interestingly enough, that's not true for the internet. Although that internet measure is pretty broad brush, we really needed a measure of um, people's use of the internet for politics and that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's really just a, how much you use the internet. And that doesn't work at all. So there's some differences there which we need to explore more. Very good question. Yes. Did you divide between uh, upmarket and midmarket and tabloid newspapers? No, no, that's a good point, Peter. But there's certainly more work to be done on that. It's just a straightforward how much exposure do you have? Now, this, uh, the coefficients are complicated in the previous models because they're logistic coefficients and they don't speak very clearly to themselves. So you have to mess around a little bit to show what's the important variables and what aren't. And this is the basis of a simulation which shows that. The length of the line tells you how big the effect is. And if the line is to the left, it's negative. If the line is to the right, it's positive. When I first ran these, I, I did it again because I thought, this can't be